Chapter 11, Matched Pairs Tea Tests. So up until this point, we've talked about tea tests comparing two. And we did one sample, and then we did two sample tea tests. And the two sample tea tests that we covered in Chapter 7 were two groups when the two groups were not connected to each other. We assume that both of the groups are simple random samples and they each represent their own populations. And we wanna know if the greater populations differ. But each sample is independent of the other sample. There's no connection between the two. Now, we're still gonna do a t-test. We're still gonna have two samples, but now we're focusing on dependent groups or groups of measurements where the populations are matched, paired, or dependent. All three of those words, one of them could apply. So we don't have two random samples that were taken independent of each other. And so in this situation, when you find yourself in this situation, we have to consider if they're not independent, then how are they connected and to what degree is the variant shared? So that is why we stopped between chapter seven and 11 and we took a detour to cover correlation and regression. Correlation measuring the covariance or the amount of overlap and variation between two variables. So I feel like a record here saying all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So George Box was first attributed to be the person that said this back in 1976, so just right before I was born. And he said this um, in two different sections of this paper. And in one section, he um, brought up the idea of parsimony. And that's basically saying that since all models are wrong, the scientists cannot obtain the correct model by excessive elaboration. Um, but on the contrary, following William Ockham, Ockham Razor, um, the researcher, he says he, but she, the researcher should seek an economical description of natural phenomena, just as the ability to advise, devise a simple but evocative model is a signature to a great scientist. So over elaboration and over parameterization is often the mark of mediocrity. So in all science, we are trying to study a very complex, interrelated, messy world. But in research, we're trying to zone in on a very small aspect relative to the messiness of the real complexities and come up with a parsimonious, simple model to explain one aspect of the world that's going on in a very messy way. So. Along with that, in another section of this paper, he did say, since all models are wrong, the scientists must be alert to what is importantly wrong. It is inappropriate to be concerned about mice when there are tigers abroad. So all models, statistical models, have assumptions. And the model giving us the right p-value, telling the right story, the model being right, or accurate or precise depends on how poorly our data meets the assumptions. So the more we violate assumptions, the more our model is untrustworthy. And there are lots of ways it can be wrong. There are lots of ways we can simplify and not all of these violations or oversimplifications are equally problematic. And so sometimes there are some things we need to worry about and some Times there are things we need to worry less about. Um, normality of the your sample is less problematic if you have a large sample because this the central limit theorem. That's one example. So how do you know what to worry about? You take this class. How do you know how to make a parsimonious, meaningful model? Well, that's what we all want to know. And statistics and research in general is more of an art than a science. No one study the truth is going to make. So we all just try to do the best we can with what we have. Key idea, though, in chapter 11 here is that if your data, your two sets of measurements are correlated, then your model should leverage the correlation. So I'm going to go over several different scenarios that would qualify as 
not being independent data. So I said if your samples of op two op two samples of observations are correlated, you should do the uh, model that includes the correlation between them. Here are some examples. So the first is an observational study. That means we're not randomizing. It's longitudinal. That means over time, repeated measurements. So this would be when we are collecting data on this say, each person before and after something is happening. Now, this could be before or after. Well, let's just see. Dr. Fishburne wishes to assess the effectiveness of a leadership workshop. Does this workshop, this intervention, do it something? So in this case, 60 middle managers were got together to have this workshop. And they rate, were rated by their immediate supervisors using the leadership rating form. And they were rated before and after the workshop. So for the first guy, Mr. Smith, he has a score before and a score after. Uh, Miss Jill has a score before and after. So each of our 60 people have a before score and an after score. So our two samples would be their before scores, the 60 before scores and the 60 after scores. Now these are not two separate samples. It is the same sample measured twice on each individual. This is not an independent groups. This is a dependent or paired samples. We have the same two sets of measurements that are paired based on who the measurements were taken on. And so here's an example of an observational longitudinal repeated measures data set. Another kind of repeated measures observational data set would be where we're not concerned with change over time. So the very first scenario, we were looking at before and after, two different time points. We might also want to look at people that are measured multiple times, but they could be cross-sectionally. For instance, Dr. Clark is interested in determining if workers are concerned with job security or job pay. He gains the cooperation of 30 individuals, it's a single sample, who work in different settings and ask the employees to rate his or her concern about both salary level and job security on a scale of one to 10. So again here, we have a single sample of people who then give two different sets of measurements. One, instead of being a before and after separated in time, we have ratings of salary levels and job security. So two different measurements per person, not necessarily a before and after, just two different aspects. Still, we cannot treat the salary level scores as if they came from a different set of people as the job security scores, because they are the same group of people giving both sets of measurements. Third example, this is observational still, but this one is a paired, pre-existing pairs. So Dr. Gale wants to know whether husbands or wives with infertility problems feel equally anxious. So this would be the female um, and the male have different roles in uh, this heterosexual couple with some biological phenomena. So she recruits 24 infertile couples. Here we have a single sample of couples, but each unit couple is made up of a husband and a wife. And this um, researcher administers the infertility anxiety measure to both the husbands and the wives. So we get two sets of scores, husband scores, wife scores. Again, the husbands are not independent of the wives. They are made, the sample has been gathered because they were coupled together. So we should not treat the husbands and wives if they're, as if they're two separate samples. We need to have our model incorporate the pairedness of the measurements. Okay, fourth and last example. This is an experimental situation of matched pairs. So in this situation, Dr. Smith has a new strategy for teaching fractions to second graders. I've worked with second graders in math, it's kind of fun. So we're gonna do ra randomization here, but there's 30 students that are available and they're going to be taught either with the old way or the new way. way. It should be one of way. Students only can learn the fraction lesson once. So they can either learn it the old way or the new way. But before randomization, the researcher takes these 30 students and matches them into partners based on important measures like could be gender and age, um, 
that vary within second graders. It could have been their previous math scores. It could be IQ scores, probably not. It could be um, reading scores. It could be overall school performance, a number of things. Anyway, so we won't focus on how, but all the students are divided and put into partnerships on paper. And then within each partnership, one of the two students gets the old way and the other one gets the new way. And then in the second partnership, one gets the new way, one gets the old way, by the flip of a coin or some random phenomenon. So we end up with 15 students in the learning the old way and 15 students learning the new way. But the important distinction here is they were paired up and then the randomization was done within each pair. That means that the students that the first student who got the old way is partnered with the new, first student that got the new way, that there is some connection between them, some similarity. And so that pairing needs to be taken into consideration when we analyze the data. Now we could have done just random assignment at the first and randomly out of the 30 picked the 15 to do the new way and the other 15 to do the old way. But it's very different when we pair up before and we're going to talk about this more but i want to point out before we get into do how we do in matched pairs or a um, dependent pair or a non -de a dependent samples t-test what scenario would qualify for this okay we're going to watch a short little video to help kind of clarify the t-test the t -test there are one sample t-test that compares a population to a sample. The question we're usually asking here is, is the su sample somehow different or the same as the population? It's called a one sample t-test because there is only one sample. We also have independent t-tests. This seven. is where there are two groups. I remember this because t-tests study two things either a population and a sample, two groups, or in a, what you'll see in a second, two measurement points. But we're always talking about two. If there's more than two, then it's a different kind of statistical test. An ANOVA. In an independent t-test, there are two groups, group one and group two. And we're trying to see what is the difference between those two groups. Or are they Again, the, same? the difference is located between. We also have dependent t-tests. This is where there's two measurement points. A lot of times this is a pre and a post test. And it's the same sample of people, but we're comparing them on their first and their second measurement point to see is there a difference within this sample before and after I've done something. So again, t-tests look at two things, either a single sample compared to a population, either two groups and looking for a difference between them, or two measurement points like a pre and post test in the same sample. Those are three kinds of t-tests that we'll be discussing more in this unit. Okay, so we're still t-tests comparing two and we want to know if there's a difference. What's new here is we're going to incorporate or include the correlation between matched measurements. This helps in several ways. It helps eliminate variance from extraneous or confounding factors. The stronger the correlation, the smaller the variability in the different scores, and the denominator thus of the t-statistic gets smaller. And when we incorporate this correlation, this is what I mean by leveraging the correlation. When we include the correlations, we end up having an observed t-score that is more extreme. So it's more powerful. Now, all, there is no free lunch in statistics. So this is a major benefit of, of incorporating correlation is we get a bigger or more extreme test statistic. But the catch is we, is we have a reduction in degrees of freedom. The sample, no, remember, we don't have two separate samples. We have one sample that's either been paired up, one sample that's made up of members that are pair, partnered, or we have two measurements on each person in our sample. And because of that, our sample is not how many measurements we have, but how many 
units we have. How many, so the sample size is how many pairs of observations. So this causes our degrees of freedom to be half what they would be if we treated it as an independent groups t-test. And that makes our critical t also higher than the independence t. So the observed t values can be bigger, but our critical t is also going to be bigger. But if there is a correlation at all between the matched pairs, then the bigger observed t pays off more than having a higher critical t to make something statistically significant. So when will we use this? In observational studies, we'd use this if our sample is made up of existing pairs of naturally related, correlated, or dependent units. So married couples made up of husband and I, wives, parent-child di dyads, anytime our sample is made up of pairs that would be a time to use this technique. If we're doing repeated measurements, if we're doing before or after, we're using the same people, but we're measuring different stimuli, having them do something in the dark and in the light. If we're looking at successive administrations, like before and after, if we're looking at even simultaneously measured, sometimes this can be a repeated measures situation. So in the before and after, we could look at their math achievement at a pretest and a post-test. At different stimuli, we could see how much someone sways if we're doing balance in the light and the dark. If we're looking at successive administration, we might give a depression inventory, and when they're done with that, then they do the anxiety inventory. Or this last one we do a lot of the time. So say you're giving the Connors autism and the hyperactivity disorder scale. That scale has a lot of different items and people fill it out. And then after it's answered, some of the items are added together to make an inattention subscore. And some of the items are added together to make a hyperactive subscore. All the items are completed at the same time, usually in a mixed order, but then they are scored such that we get two different subscores from the same questionnaire. All of these are observational situations where we have partnering, pairing, or dependence between the pairs of observations made on a single sample. So there's usually no control group in these studies. We Everyone had, would have a pre and a post two time points. These before and after designs have a benefit in that every person is their own control group, so to speak, but there are weaknesses to this design as well. So some of the things you have to be careful of is history. Experiences outside the study may affect the measurements before and after treatment. And it's hard to do that when you don't have a control group that didn't get the treatment or a placebo. There's also the problem of Turing. If you're doing a before and after score and they're separated in time, if they're far apart in time, you might have natural maturity happening. So if I'm studying second graders learning to read and my before my pre-score is at the beginning of the school year and the post-score is at the end of the school year, I would assume even if my intervention does nothing, the pre to post-score, I would see some maturing just based on natural aging. Um, so that's something you need to take into consideration if you are planning a before and after design. The other problem, this third bullet point, is attrition. This is a biggie when we're doing anything longitudinal or over time, is that you tend to have people drop out or to stop participating. So if you have before pre-score, but they never show up to take the post-score, you're kind of in the lurch. You can't use that data in a t-test. A t-test has to have two measurements per person. A person with only one measurement cannot be used in the analysis. There's also this idea of regression towards the mean. So when we have only two time points, you must assume that any change is true change, not noise. Um, if we have three time points, you might, if nothing's going on, you wouldn't expect them to be perfectly the same every time because it's going to depend on what they have for breakfast, what face the moon is, are their shoes too tight if they're a kiddo. And regression towards the mean says that if you get an, an extremely high score one time, you're probably going to have maybe a lower score the second time just because of natural fluctuation. And that's not something you can deal with if you have two time points only.
So this idea that you have to assume that all change is true change. So these all these bullet points here are problems with or drawbacks to only having two time points and no control group. And this last one, if you're in education especially, I would pay attention to. If your before scores or your after scores or both of them are skewed or tending towards the extreme limit, your change scores can be problematic. For instance, if I am using a spelling test that a teacher gives in their classroom for a week to teach spelling, if we're doing elementary kiddos here, I can probably guarantee that the pre-scores on that spelling test are very low, with most kids getting close to zero or very low numbers. And the post score, if we've done our job well as a teacher, we'd expect the post scores to be 100% or A's. If you have that floor or ceiling effect at one or the other or both time points, then your change scores can be very problematic. So things to think about if you're planning a before and after design. We also, I've noted before, we can have repeated measures designs that are not longitudinal. Longitudinal usually means we want to look at change over time. But we can have other repeated measurements where we don't care about change over time. We want to just check two different scenarios, and so we have to give them at two different time points. Um, often this happens, say we want to look at um, a drug, classic example, drug A and drug B. We can't give them at the same time, so we have to give them at different times. This, not because we expect there to be a change over time, but we just have, can't administer them at the same time. This would be successive, meaning one after the other design. Um, here's a picture of what we might do to do a crossover design. If I have medication A and medication B, pill A, P, pill B, whatever it is, therapy A, therapy B, I can't give them at the same time, so I'm going to give them one after another. But when we're giving two different interventions or two different time points um, to measure something, maybe we're doing it in dark and light, if the first measurement or intervention or phase could affect what happens down the line, then we have to be worried about what's called crossover effects. So this could be fatigue effects where, oh, we're tired of doing this, we're just gonna, you know, go through the motions, or learning effects where your participants go, ah, I know what's going on, and they can figure out the system. So if there is any kind of change over time that has nothing to do with the administration of the thing you're testing, we often will do a crossover design where We'll randomly, in the green box, take our sample, divide them into two groups. The first group will get A before B, and the second group will get B before A. We want to balance out and have half our sample getting one order and the other half of our sample getting the second ordering. So we can overall cancel out the effect of order, fatigue, or learning. The gray box in the middle here says washout. A washout period is when you allow some time in between your phases of your study for the effect of the first phase to wash out or to diminish before you start the second effect. If I'm getting giving medication A to help with depression and I then immediately change to medication B, if A works and B doesn't, the effect of A might be prolonged into the time that they're taking the second medication. So even if I switch quickly, I would want to wait a week or days or months, depending on what you're doing, to allow the effect of the first phase to wear off and the effect of the second phase to kind of kick in. So counterbalancing is alternating the order and washout period is allowing time in between the two. Um, to, and both of these things can help with carryover effect and when we have these crossover designs. So why would we bother doing a crossover design where everyone gets A and everyone gets B? And whether that's a treatment and a control or two different treatments or two different questionnaires, depression and inventory. Maybe we give some people the depression questionnaire first, and the depression second, and vice versa, again, because of fatigue and learning effects. So 
we want to minimize the risk of order being a confounding factor. Um, also, why would we want to do both things to each person? Well, then we only have to have half as many people in our study, less people to enroll and to keep track of. But anytime we do both A and B to each person, we run the risk of asking too much of each person and having them give up, drop out, um, and losing part of our sample. So designing a study is not an easy thing. This is why for your thesis or your dissertation, you're going to write a proposal and you're going to get feedback from some people that have done like-minded studies before to know what might go wrong and things you might want to plan differently. Because once you start gathering data, you can't go back. This is why grants ask for a proposal. Proposals are not a negative thing. They're a great thing to do to get more feedback, collaboration. Um, because the more times you do a study, the more your brain starts thinking, um, like the adversary starts looking for what might go wrong, playing devil's advocate. Because these things, if they go wrong, a fatigue effect, a learning effect, they can negate any data, make it worthless. You don't want that. So it's not, you know, we want lots of feedback. We want lots of planning time here when we're putting together a study because how long does your washout period need to be? How long are those carry effects over effects going to last? Maybe I need to take more time to do this study. Um, a lot of this is more of an art than a science and maybe some trial runs and some piloting studies are needed. So let's look again at simple randomization versus matched pairs. So in a simple randomization scheme, we have a sample of participant, that's these colored drop dots at the beginning, and we randomize just each person flip of a coin to decide if they're going to be in the treatment group or the control group. So randomization, really great because it, each participant has an equal chance of being the treatment or control group. Then over the long run, the treatment and control group should be approximately equivalently made up. Now, it does not guarantee that the two groups will have the same distribution. It does not guarantee that if my whole sample has 50% women, that both of the subsamples will get 50% women. Just means that each woman has a 50% chance of being in either group. So matched pairs designed or stratified randomization is where you take your sample and before you randomize, you have this extra step where you match up participants with their closest partner. And then within each partnership, you do random assignment. I want you to look at these little green bins comparing simple randomization to matched pairs design. Matched pairs design, when it's done well, ensures that your makeup of your two groups will be approximately equal. That sounds like what we always want, but there's a problem here. The problem is deciding what to match on. Are we going to match on age and gender? Because those are the only two variables we were able to get off our demographic survey. What if age and gender don't really matter in the thing we're studying, but family history does? If you match on things that don't matter, you can end up making bias samples on things that do matter. And so if you are unable to measure things that are important to match on, matching on unimportant things actually shoots you in the foot. And so being able to know what's important to match on and then being able to accurately measure the thing that's important can make match pairs designs not a feasible option. So if I think family history of depression and anxiety or family history of learning disorders are the most important thing to match on and I don't have a good tool to, or a really good idea that I could accurately have my sample give me that information, then I, you're probably better off doing a simple random sample to begin with. Again, simple random samples, we're going to use an independent groups t-test like we did in chapter seven. Matched pairs design, we're going to include the matching, who's matched with he, who, and make it a matched pairs t-test that we're learning now in chapter 11. So every type of study has some drawbacks. So before and after designs, pro, we get to see change over time. We talked about its con. Matched pairs t-test, we get 
equivalent subsamples, uh, and only if you can ascertain important things and match on them. Because the other thing is, what if you have someone that doesn't match anyone or the matching is poor? Then we can have problems with match designs as well. So experimental studies overall can have their own problems. So potentially characteristics, yeah, so what, what do we match on? How many variables to match on? Can you reliably measure those matching things? Um, how do you ensure that you have well-matched pairs? What makes a good matched pairs? Um, yeah, so what I said down here in the bottom of the slide, picking the wrong matching variables or not measuring them well is irreversible. So after you've done the matching and randomized, you cannot undo that. So you can't explore alternative hypotheses because you can't unmatch them. So all designs have flaws and problems. I guess that's my overall message. Okay, we're gonna watch, this is a slightly longer um, video, but um, this comes to us from Crash Course Statistics. Hi, I'm Adrienne Hill, and welcome back to Crash Course Statistics. In the last episode, we dove into the logic surrounding test statistics and talked about a general formula that allows us to create formulas for lots of different situations. There are so many questions we might want to answer, and it would be rough if we had to memorize a new formula for every single one. No and sometimes statistics is taught in a way that makes it seem like there's a different formula you need to know if you want to test whether your bus is late more often than the average bus in your town or if burns treated with aloe actually heal faster than those that are left alone. But huzzah, we can adapt the general formula in all sorts of situations. <laughs> Let's say that you just moved to a new place and you're looking for the best coffee in town. Since you've been watching Crash Course Statistics, you decide to do a little impromptu experiment. Word on the street is there are two really popular coffee places near you, Caffeined and The Blend In. So one Sunday after brunch, you grab a random sample of 16 of your new friends and randomly give half of them an unmarked cup with coffee from Caffeined and the other half an unmarked cup with coffee from The Blend In. You make sure to get the same roast, dark, to keep things as even as possible. After delicate sniffs and sips of coffee in a process known as cupping, the tallies are in. On a scale of 1 to 10, caffeine got a mean score of 7.6 and the blend in got a mean score of 7.9. So we observe a difference between the coffee scores. Coffee from caffeine scored 0.3 points lower than coffee from the blend in. So coffee from the blend in is better, right? Done and done. No, not quite yet. Maybe it's just random chance. We don't know. So first we need to define our null. There's no difference between the two coffee shops. And then our alternative hypothesis, that there is a difference. One is better than the other. In this case, we're interested in whether the mean scores for coffee are different between caffeine and the blend in. With a little algebra, we can see that this is the same thing as asking whether the difference between the two means is not zero. Now that Okay, can I go back to that? Probably not. So we're saying that the mu's, the means in the whole populations, are essentially equal versus unequal. We have our hypotheses. We can do a t-test. Specifically, we'll do a two-sample t-test, also called an independent or unpaired t-test. The formula for a two-sample t-test follows our general test statistic formula. The difference we observed is 0.3. If the null hypothesis were true and there's no difference between the coffee shops, we'd expect a difference of zero. So the numerator of our t-test is 0.3. For this kind of t-test, our measure of average variation is the standard error. For two groups, the standard standard error is calculated a bit differently since we have to account for the sample variance of two groups. Here okay, so what she's doing right now is the independent groups t-test we learned in chapter 7. And I'm going to let this play through and then she's going to go over a scenario that's different that has the pairing. Here we're squaring the standard deviation to get the variance. And n1 and n2 are the sizes of the two groups. Both are 8 here. Now that we have our t value, we can figure out if there's a statistically significant difference between the two coffee shops. And there are two ways to do this. We can calculate the critical t value, and if our t statistic is greater than the critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. 
Okay, so this first way she's talking about the critical value is what we do by hand with the textbook table, if that's all we got. Or we can calculate the p-value from our t-statistic, and we can reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is smaller than our chosen alpha level. To do it. Okay, so then the second way to do the test is with a p-value, and that's what we usually do when the computer spits out a an exact p-value to like 10 decimal places. Either of these things. We'll need to choose our alpha level. Again, our alpha is arbitrary, but usually people will use 0.05, since that means that in the long run, only 5% of tests done on groups with no real difference will incorrectly reject the null. So we'll conform and use an alpha of 0.05 here. To calculate our critical t-value, we need to find the t-values which correspond to the top 5% most extreme values in our t distribution. Usually a computer or calculator will do this for you, so we're not going to go into the formula. But here are the cutoffs. The cutoffs for our specific problem are about negative 2.145 and 2.145. We have two cutoffs because we're doing a two-tailed test. We want to reject the null if coffee from caffeine is better or if coffee from the blend in is better. We can already tell that we should fail to reject the null, that there's no clear difference between the quality of the coffee. Our T statistic of about 0.44 isn't close to negative 2.145. Okay, remember we reject if our test statistic observed is more extreme than what we would expect by the null hypothesis. Or 2.145. The critical value and p-value approach will give you identical results, so we don't really need to do both. But for the sake of showing we get the same outcome, our calculated p-value here is 0.6684. We reject the null if the p-value is smaller than alpha. So again, we fail to reject since 0.6684 is way bigger than 0.05. One thing that's nice about the p-value approach, and the reason we'll mainly rely on it throughout the rest of these examples, is that p-values are easier for us non-computers to interpret. A p-value of 0.6684 means that if there were no difference in scores between coffee from caffeine and coffee from the blend in, we'd still expect to see a difference in our sample means that's 0.3 or greater pretty often. 66.84% of the time. Since our observed difference of 0.3 or greater is pretty common under the null hypothesis, we haven't found evidence that it's a bad fit. That's why we failed to reject it. So right now we don't have any evidence that one coffee shop is better than the other. But remember, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And while our coffee excursion and experiment were well designed, we can probably improve it. If you look at the scores your friends gave the coffees, you'll see that there's one person who tried coffee from caffeine and really hated it. After looking through your scorecards, you realize it's Alex, who has mentioned in the past that she just doesn't love coffee. What gets you thinking, even though you randomly assigned your friends to either get coffee from caffeine or coffee from the blend in, that design didn't account for the fact that some people just like coffee more than other people. Okay, so this is where we get into chapter 11. When we randomly assign, that can control for extraneous variables. But if we have a smallish sample, it doesn't control it very well. So what do we do to make our study stronger? Alex might give the best coffee in the world a measly six point rating just because coffee's not really her thing. Whereas your always caffeinated friend Cameron would probably give that day old coffee in the break room a score of seven just because he loves coffee. So in addition to any true difference in scores between coffee from caffeine and coffee from the blend in, our sample means are also affected by how much the people in each group like coffee. You randomly assigned your friend to groups, so you don't expect that there's some systematic difference between the average coffee enjoyment of the groups, but random assignment adds variation, which can make it harder to see a true difference between the coffee scores. One solution to this issue is a paired t-test. You could try to pair up your friends based on how much they like coffee, and then randomly assign one to coffee from caffeine and the other to coffee from the blend in, and repeat this over and over until everyone's been assigned. The best match, of course, for a person is themselves. I'm just like me. So you decide to call another random sample of 16 of your friends. This time you give all of them both caffeine fiend coffee and the blend in coffee. Okay, so the difference here, we're not going to bother with the matching because that's its whole, a whole nother ball of wax. But instead, each person function 
as their own control. Each person is given both the caffeine and the blend in. So each person provides two measurements. Now we could do the crossover design where half of them get caffeine first and half of them get blend in first. And are we gonna have them swish their mouth with water in between so that the taste of the first doesn't carry over um, to the second, but we'll simplify and they record their scores. Now that everyone has scored both coffees, you can be sure that the two groups have the exact same level of coffee affinity, since it's the exact same people. The mean scores are still affected by variation due to individual coffee preferences, but since the exact same people are in both groups, we can extract that variation and throw it away, so to speak. One way to do this is to make a different score for each person. This will tell you how much more they like coffee from caffeine than coffee from the blend in. Now that we have only one list of values, the different scores, our matched pairs t-test will look surprisingly similar to the one sample t-test that we've seen before. We observed a mean difference of negative 0.18125. Now this is the difference, the mean difference score. So we've taken the two scores, subtracted them, and then did the average after we've subtracted. <laughs> which means that on average, people rated coffee from the blend in 0.18125 points higher than coffee from caffeine. The null hypothesis here is that there's no difference between ratings for coffee from caffeine and coffee from the blend in. So we'd expect our mean difference to be zero. And our measure of average variation is just the standard error of the different scores. Putting it together, we get a T statistic of about negative 3.212. Before we get to the corresponding P value that our computer spits out, let's consider another way to think about what T statistics are actually telling us. T statistics tell us how many standard errors away from the mean our observed difference is. Though the T distribution isn't exactly normal, it's reasonably close, so we can use our intuition about normal distributions to understand our t-values. Normal distributions have about 68% of their data within one standard deviation from the mean, and about 95% within two standard deviations. That means that t-scores around three, like ours, are about three standard errors away from the mean. Only around 0.3% of scores are that far away, so it makes sense that our p-value is very small. 0 0.00582, which allows us to reject the null hypothesis so there's no difference between the scores for coffee from caffeine and coffee from the blend end, which means that from now on, I'll be buying my coffee from the blend end except for when I'm meeting up with Alex, then I'll buy tea. Statistical tests help us wade through the murky waters of variability, and our goal should be to get rid of as much of that variability as possible so we can see patterns. We can see, for example, whether exercise improves sleep, which your friends might be lacking after all that coffee, or whether your hearing could be hurt by listening to loud music by Cream or Ice Cube or Vanilla Ice or some other musician that sounds like it belongs in coffee. Like Spoon. Spoon? Yeah, Brandon Spoon. <laughs> but more importantly, we're learning that all of those formulas you may have seen floating around really aren't that different. We're just comparing what we see to what we think we should see. We're always comparing the way things are to how we'd expect them to be. And statistics is no exception. We now have the tools to design experiments and answer a lot of interesting questions and do our own experiments, even if we over caffeinate some of our friends in the process. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Crash course. Okay. So we have what seems like a ton of formulas. And here is the first page of our formula sheet document. And we've already used a lot of the formulas on the sheet. And hopefully now you can take a step back and see how they are very similar, even though they have differences among them. So in the top part, I have the Z and the T table when you have one sample. And this was chapter five and six highlighted in the light blue. Then at the bottom in the purple highlighting, we have the chapter seven formulas, which were two independent samples, not paired up. And we're still looking to see, in those we're looking to see if there's a difference, but hypothesis test, we have what we observed minus what we expect under the null hypothesis divided by some measure of standard error. Right now, we're in chapter 11, we're gonna look at the center portion of this formula sheet. This is when we have matched pairs.
So over on the side, I want to point out in the independent, two independent samples with not paired, our num we have an N1, which is our sample size in group one, and N2, which is our sample size in group two. When we're doing matched pairs, we only have plain little n. That's because it's the number of pairs of observations. So if I have five parents, I should have five child, if children. If I'm doing parent, child, die, adds. If I'm doing pre-post, if I have four pre-scores, I should have four post-scores. To be able to use an observation, it has to be pa paired up to do the paired t-test. And you'll hear paired t-test and match pairs t-test and dependent samples t-test, all the same thing. Two groups of measurements usually made on one sample, whether that's a sample of dyads or a sample of individuals. Okay, so focusing in on the center part of this sheet, um, in the first column, the estimate, we want to know is the estimate different than zero, well usually zero. And so we're looking at the difference. Now, capital D by itself means the difference for each pair. So if we're doing before and after, capital D is the difference between the first and the second. And that's what's in green. In orange, we have the D bar. That means the average difference. And you can calculate this by doing the average of all the first scores minus the average of all the second scores. And so D bar is the average difference Capital D by itself means all the individual differences or the different scores. Sometimes we'll call these gain scores if we're expecting something to go up or change scores just in general. So we have a different formula for the standard error of D bar. There's the one highlighted in green and the one highlighted in orange. And the one in green is the direct difference method and the one in orange is called the correlation method. Both of these sets of formulas, both of these methods, give identical results on the same data. Um, but it's important to kind of know the distinction because they're doing the same test underneath the hood, so to speak. So if we move over to the column that says test statistic, where those arrows are, in the direct differences on top, we have... I hope that the mouse, oh, the mouse is going to show up. Good, good, good. So we have on top of the T statistic, notice we have D bar minus mu sub zero. This is the null hypothesis value, which is almost always zero, that there is no difference. If we look at the down below that in the orange highlighted area, the T score is still on top D bar minus mu of the null hypothesis. So the top of the test statistic is the same, the average difference. The bottom is slightly different. Both of them have degrees of freedom of n minus 1. Again, n is the number of pairs. The green highlighting shows that this is the standard error of the differences divided by square root of n. This is very much the same as a one-sample t-test because the direct difference approach has you take the two measurements and subtract each pair to come up with a new sample of different scores. The correlation method, the formula looks a lot scarier, but it will give you the same numbers. And if you look really closely, that is the same, almost exact same formula as our two sample test. We have S1 squared and S2 squared. Now it's over little n instead of each over their own sample sizes because Again, we're pairing up, so N1 and N2 are the same number, number of pairs. But I have circled in a light orange here, the subtracting twice the correlation times S1, S2 divided by N. This is the leveraging of the correlation. This um, video said that this, we're removing variation, and this is where we're removing it from. We are leveraging the correlation by removing correlation as in the covariation between the two scores, we're taking out person-to-person -person variation. In the example in the last video, there was one person who just didn't like cross coffee across the board, so she gives low scores across the board, versus there was some other person that loved coffee and they gave high scores across the board. That's person-to-person -person variability, and here we are extracting it by subtracting this part underneath the square root in the standard error for the difference. Okay, so the direct approach has you take 
all your x1 and x2s, your two sets of scores, and subtract them for each person. So that we, instead of having two lists of scores, we get one list of different scores. And then we calculate the standard deviation and the mean from those different scores. We no longer have two separate scores, we've subtracted them. And then we can use our one sample t-test formulas. The correlation method has you summarize the averages and standard deviations of both sets of scores separately and calculate the correlation between the two. And then you would plug them into this other formula. Both of these approaches or methods will give you identical results. One may be easier than the other if you're working by hand, but it, it really doesn't matter which approach you take. On the homework, I'm gonna have you do both to practice both. So we're gonna watch one more little video here. So we're gonna introduce the paired t-test. The paired t-test is a parametric approach or a large sample approach um, that's used to compare the means of two paired groups, compare two dependent groups or matched groups. And the reason for pairing or matching is this reduces the biological variability between the two groups. Um, so for example, we might be looking at the same person measured under two different treatments. Or we may have the um, same individual measured before and then after receiving some treatment. Or in cases where we don't have the same individual, we might take someone who's in treatment A and we might match them with someone in treatment B. And usually we match on age, gender, or other variables that we think are um, important. So again, Now let me stress here, for match pairs design, the matching has to happen before the assignment to groups. There are other methods out there for matching afterwards, but that's something completely different. This matching is occurring before the assignment to group or intervention. You cannot do this after the fact. Again, the idea behind this matching is to make the, the person in group A and group B as identical as possible. So we're going to take a look at this example here, the simplest form of uh, paired data, the before and after experiment. So we're going to look at um, individuals having their systolic blood pressure measured before receiving some treatment and then measured again after receiving that treatment. And we're going to use a simple data set, only 11 observations here. And again, this is so that we can see all the data on the screen and um, focus on the concepts, not the calculations. So um, our goal here is to, to measure, does this, is this drug effective in decreasing systolic blood pressure? So to try and visualize this, we can make side-by-side -side box plots, comparing the before measurements and the after measurements. Or we can make this form of paired plot where we connect each before measurement to the after measurement using a line, which helps us see if they're trending downwards or upwards. So ultimately our question is, is this drug effective? And the way that we'll define that is by looking at, does the mean systolic blood pressure decrease after treatment? We can also look at, does the median decrease? And we'll do that in following videos using slightly different approaches. Earlier we learned the underlying concepts of hypothesis testing and confidence intervals and we're going to lean on that understanding here to build up a hypothesis test okay, and a ready? confidence interval for now. two paired groups. So what we're about to talk about is known as the paired t-test. So here we'd like to test the null hypothesis that the mean systolic blood pressure after is the same as the mean before. Or we can also write this as the difference in after and before is equal to zero. The right? Again, signifying no difference zero. or no change. And recall that in hypothesis testing, we start by assuming our null is true and then see if we can provide evidence against that. The alternative hypothesis is that the mean after is less than the mean before. And we talked previously about one versus two sided tests. We'll do a one-sided test here um, for simplicity, but we could easily write this as a, a two-sided if we preferred that. We can also write this as the difference in after minus before is less than zero, right? Meaning on average there was so a decrease. You You'll notice here that the reason we um, prefer to express it this way rather than this way is here we've boiled it down to a single number being our estimate, the difference in means. And remember, we learned 
how to test hypotheses or build confidence intervals, and they generally relied on this concept. Um, let's take a confidence interval, for example. Take our estimate and tack on a margin of error, right? Our estimate plus or minus about two standard errors of the estimate. Okay, and now this is our estimate here. One thing that you'll notice is that this data is paired, right? We have measurements before and we have measurements after. So we could consider looking at the change, okay, or the difference. So let's add that in here. If we look at the change or the difference. Change is a triangle. You'll notice that chemistry. taking the um, after measurement minus the before measurement, we're going to end up with negative 8 for the, the first person. Right, we've had a decrease of 8. For the second person, we've got an increase of 3, a decrease of 6, an increase of 3, a decrease of 15, a decrease so of 4, calculating the difference a decrease of 12, scores, those capital D. an increase of 8. So if we have 11 people, we have 11 of 22, capital D. A decrease of 4, different scores. and a decrease of 11. Okay, so one thing to note here is now we've essentially put ourselves back in the um, same scenario as the one sample t-test that we learned about earlier. Right? Rather than looking at before measurements and after measurements, since they're paired, we can take advantage of that and look at the change and care of the difference. Now we've got this single variable here. We can calculate the mean for these. Okay, let's see if he does. So I'm going to label that D bar, and care of the average dis average difference. Right? And we can sum from I going one to n, each of the individual differences divided by the sample size. We're calculate the average of these differences here, and you're going to find that comes out to negative six point one eight. So on average, there was a decrease of about six point one eight after treatment. We can also calculate the standard deviation of these. Okay, and again, a reminder of the standard deviation. It tells us on average how far are individual differences moving from that mean. So I can label that little s of d, okay, the standard deviation of the differences. And again, and you if you take to work those that out, d scores, you're going to find it comes out to be 8.76. And just plug them into a standard okay, deviation so calculator. Now, rather than um, comparing the mean after to the mean before, right, we've noted we can take this difference. So we can express the null hypothesis that the mean difference is zero. First, an alternative hypothesis that the mean difference is less than zero, right? Or on average, there was a decrease. So again, as mentioned earlier, we're in the case of doing the one sample t-test, we can use the exact same approaches here. So first we can think, if our null hypothesis is true, and again, if the null is true, always assume the null is true. If on average there really is um, no change or no difference. How likely are we to get a sample difference of 6.18 or more by chance? Okay, and again, we're here. We're going to look in the one tail because we're doing a um, one one tailed or one sided hypothesis test. We could easily do the two sided test if we preferred that. Same approach we used earlier. Our test statistic looks at how far is the difference we saw in our sample from what we hypothesized.